So in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about circular motion and how it applies to satellite type objects in orbit around another object. So the first thing we're going to look at is the equations for centripetal acceleration. So a lot of people use the word centrifugal wrongly when we're talking about this, but it's always going to be centripetal. Okay. So we want to work out what the centripetal acceleration of an object and so we've got this blue object here and it's in orbit and it will have an acceleration towards the center and if we want to calculate that there are two equations we can use to calculate that we can use the velocity squared over r or you can have what's called the angular acceleration squared times r and just a side note here, if you want to calculate between angular velocity and actual velocity, you have that, and your angular speed is basically going to be 1 over the time period there. So that gives you it actually a an in degrees per second is angular speed. Anyway, I'm getting off, off sidetracked here. So we've got our two equations for centripetal accelerations. We want to work out centripetal force. Obviously, force is mass times acceleration. So we've got two equations for that too. You've got mv squared over r, or f equals m omega squared r. So these are your two equations that are going to be relevant to the satellites and their motion. And if you want some more detail on these, I'm going to make uh, another video later on about where these equations come from. But moving on quickly. So the other thing we know about circular motion, obviously, is that it will be obeying Newton's law of gravitation. So we have, let's write that down. So it's obviously m multiplied by g of r squared, so that's Newton's law of gravitation. So if we equate that to our mv squared over r, we can do some cancelling out, and get left with v squared equal to g m over r, or obviously v is equal to the square root G M over R. Obviously, we're only going to consider the positive square root here. Obviously, you could think and in theory consider the negative one, but only the positive one is actually relevant here. So that's what I'm going to stick to. Okay. So we want to work out the time period, and the time period is the time it takes to do one complete orbit of this. So we think if we've got a circle here whose radius is R. We want to work out the total distance travelled, so basically the perimeter of the circle, obviously that's going to be 2 pi r. And then obviously to get to time from distance we need to divide by the velocity. So if we want to get the, calculate the time period, you're taking the, the total distance it would travel around the orbit and you divide it by the velocity and that would give you an expression for the time period then should you wish you can then substitute in your expression for velocity and you would end up with 2 pi r over square root of g m over r if you want to see a full derivation of this I'll do it in a subsequent video but obviously I'm trying to get the key points across and you'll end up with t is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over g m. So basically what's happened is you put the top line into a square root, so then you can merge them all into one. But like I said, I'll go into further detail on that on another video. So that's our expression for the time period. So that's the time taken to complete one complete orbit. So let's have a look at some specific types of satellites. So we have the geosynchronous satellite, or often known as a geostationary satellite. The key thing to know is it orbits above the same position on the Earth 
and actually they are above the equator. That's how it manages to stay on above the same point. And they have exactly the same time period as one rotation of the Earth. So that's how they track the same point, because their time period is the same as the time it takes for the Earth to rotate. So it has a lot of very useful um, properties. So it's used mo mostly in communication. Because obviously if something's in the same position in the sky, you can point your aerials and satellite dishes at the same point in the sky, and they'll you'll get a reception every time. So it's used in for things like TV and mobile and that sort of thing. So that's a geosynchronous or geostationary. There's another type called polar orbits, where the orbits are going round over the poles. And they are travelling at a much faster velocity in orbit, so they're much lower in the sky. And they actually have a much shorter time period than the rotation of the Earth, which is useful for uh, m like mapping things. So obviously if you want a satellite that's covering lots of different parts of the Earth, it allows you to map lots of different parts of the Earth, which is very useful. So, so things like satellite imaging. Obviously, these are just a few examples, but there are many, many more uses for satellites. We don't spend that hundreds of millions just for these uses. But these are just some examples of the different uses and the different properties of those satellites.